Sing praise. 
Oh, oh boy. Praise the Lord. Please take your seats. Wow, that's a workout on the guitar and brings <laughs> strings out of tune, but that's okay. Some of you may not be aware, we wouldn't have been aware except some friends contacted us last night to turn on the TV. Something very significant happened in the earth. The nation of Iran, for the first time in history, fired drones and missiles directly at the state of Israel. And this is a first. There's been many groups we call proxy groups working on behalf of Iran. Everyone knows that from all sides, but they've had what's called plausible deniability. Oh, well, those other people, Houthis, Hamas, uh, what have you, have been doing these things, but not us. But this time they directly did that. And uh, it's expected that Israel has to do something. Now, let me just say this. We have, uh, we are a church, we're all here together, and yet people are at all sorts of different places on the spectrum of how much knowledge they have of various matters, and even those of us who try, try to track this carefully, we're not on the total inside, we're just hearing second and third hand, even though we try to keep close to these things. And beyond all that, the experts at times disagree, and ultimately, the counsel of the Lord, it shall stand. Now, it seems appropriate that as we open in prayer that we would pray for this matter. But as I pray for this matter, there's, there's realities of, of a variety of sorts of people that could be killed, uh, uh, expanding conflagration, although most don't think that could happen, but one never knows. The, the simple shooting, one assassination back in August of 1914 started World War One, just a gunshot. So, so one doesn't know. And so it's appropriate that we, the people of God, would pray this morning. But I'm saying ahead of time, I know my prayer will not satisfy you. I'm not quite hitting the points clearly enough because you're in the know about what ought to be prayed about. And others of you are going, what? I'm just going to try to lean into a kingdom prayer. But it seems like we ought to pray Jesus said men should not faint but ought always to pray. And actually, this event has some relevance to even what we're going to be preaching about this morning. So would you join me, please, in prayer? Father, we're pausing right now in this worship service to fully acknowledge you, the sovereign of the universe, creator of the universe, Master, Lord, working all things after the counsel of your own will, as you taught us through Isaiah, the nations in your sight are as the dust on a scale. They're, they're nothing. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh when the nations create uproars. So, Father, we just pause to recognize him with whom we have to do. And we're coming to you in the name of Jesus, who he is, all that he's done, all that he's presently doing. And in some mystery, the core mystery of our faith, Jesus, the God-man, a man has been elevated into the place of the heavenlies. Jesus is back where he was with you before, but he now has an identification with humanity in a way that wasn't before, and this just astounds us. And it is to this one we are looking for cleansing of blood that our hearts can be scoured clean from an evil conscience and that Lord you could have your way with us and Lord we would like to however prayer works at the end of the day there could be some sort of uniting in heart and spirit with one voice there, there's something of a kingdom extension that we could all amen so Father I pray now for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and even after that prayer, recognizing that I am a uh, a vessel, a weak vessel that sees in part, I'm asking for your help now and pray. Father, we're coming before you, and we're asking in the in the issue before us of Iran, Persia, who was actually a friend of Israel back in the Old Testament now for the first time in world history, has struck another sovereign nation this way. So, Lord, 
we are praying that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that your kingdom purposes would rule and reign. Lord, we are aware of an exploding church, a Bible-believing, blood-bought church in Iran, and we know of many others that can't stand being under this regime. But Lord, we don't want harm to come to them. Yet, Lord, we know that Arab nations all around are hoping that Iran will be taken out, just taken off the table in the, in the chess game of world politics. Father, these things are too high for us, but we're aware that the, all that's out there and much more that we're not going to mention in prayer. But Lord, this is why we're appealing to you. We're appealing to you who knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart, that the one whose the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Lord, you can turn the king's hearts. Lord, we're praying According to the command given by Paul, I pray first of all that all prayer and supplication and thanksgiving be made for kings, rulers. So, Lord, we're praying for those in Iran, for those in Israel, United States, Britain, France, all the different players, whatever's going on at the UN. Father, we're, we're, we're trusting that as we're praying, somehow for your will to be done, that it, that it looses things in the earth. It looses and strengthens angels somehow to be doing your will. So, Lord, as best we know how as a body, we are praying over this situation. Jesus, again, you taught men should not faint, but ought always to pray. And whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. So, Lord, we're, we're praying for your will to be done, your kingdom to come, and that, Lord, all that happens would somehow conspire together to move us ever closer to the day of Jesus' return. We pray in his name, amen, yes. amen and amen. And Father, we pray for our service now that we could continue to be that many-membered body sharing out of the abundance that you've given us all week long. And we pray, Lord, for every body around this uh, Christian body, Christian church around this area, bless them richly with your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. With that, I'm going to invite Ted Muir to come and give us the morning reading. The reading this morning continues in the book of John 16. Uh, 18 through 33. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy, that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until, you now, until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and, and, and believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to ask anyone, do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God, finally. 
You will leave at last, Jesus answered, but a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The word of the Lord. Amen. Let's stand and worship him. just wait on him. Let's just allow our eyes to be fixed on him. Fix your mind, fix your sights on things that are above. Lord, we are actively waiting on you as a servant waits for his master. As children wait for their father eagerly to come home, Lord, we're waiting for you. And Lord, we confess that down here in this weary land, we need your garland of grace. And so we receive it now. Strength for today. Hope for tomorrow.
My greatness is beheld in your eyes, says the Lord. I am great. I am that I am. I don't need anyone to tell me who I am because I know who I am, says the Lord. While my heart cries out that every one of my children would truly understand how great I am because my greatness is beheld in your eyes. If you don't see me as great, though I am great, I shall not be great in your eyes. You won't see me as being great in your lives because you're not fully putting your trust in me because you're not seeing me for who I am, says the Lord. Ask me to give you eyes that you might see, ears that you might hear, and a voice to speak the wonders of my person, says the Lord. For I am that I am. And the world needs to know who I am. And you need to know beyond the shadow of doubt that I am the great one of Israel. Father, our prayer is that our eyes will be open, our ears will be open that our feet would step into action, Father God, that we would open our mouths, whatever we find ourselves in, whatever moment of life of the day we find ourselves in at the supermarket, whatever it might be, that we would not hold back as you speak something to our hearts to share with someone. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you are so involved in our daily existence that every breath that we take, God, we take because you help us to take that breath. And every word that we speak, we speak because you give us something to say. So, Father, with my brothers and sisters, before your throne of grace this morning, Father, we say to you, have your way with us. We submit to you, Lord God, give you thanks for the Spirit in us, that teaches us all things and reveals all things to us. The Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit who is alive and makes us live. We don't receive from the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. And because we have the Holy Spirit, whatever we walk, it's sacred ground. It's holy ground. God, my prayer, and I know that of my brothers and sisters, is that we would have the understanding that Jesus had of who you are. The companionship of your presence that was with him 24-7, oh God. We already have the Spirit dwelling in us as he did. But perhaps none of us, God, are as intimate with you as Jesus was when he walked this earth. And if we are not, Lord, it's not because you're holding anything back. Because it is because we are not seeing you for the great God that you are. So, Father, we stand with you, God. We stand with you in support of Israel. We stand with you, God, as we ask that you would be merciful in all of this, Lord. We ask that your grace would extend not only over the nation of Israel, but over the Christians in Israel, Lord. And the Christians in Iran, Lord. And the Christians in that Middle East part of the world, Father God. I have been spending some time in prayer this week, and you spoke Ezekiel 38 to me. And I encourage everyone here to go look up what that says. And Lord, I know that it is your will, O oh God, that the world will see you sovereign in all of this. Lord, I've been watching CNN. I've been watching Fox. I've been watching Italian television, Lord, to get the different perspectives. I don't know how many people actually understand how we involved Turkey is in supporting Iran in this. When the attacks took place, people were dancing in the streets of Istanbul and Ankara, 
shouting in support of Palestine. Palestine free from the river to the sea is not what you want. And it should not be what we want, God. So we thank you for being the great one of Israel who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond anything that we could ask or even think to ask of you. Thank you for being sovereign, Lord. And in knowing that you are sovereign, we rest in peace. We rest in joy. And we rest in determination to do our part and pray and give you the glory in Jesus' name. I will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem. I will be a wall of fire around Israel. Anyone that comes against them one way shall flee from them seven ways. For I am their protector. I am their provider, though many don't know it. Shine the light of Jesus Christ. Shine the light in prayer. Shine the light in my word, my true word. Call the word forth into my country, into my nation, into my nations. And I will be a wall of fire around my people, saith the Lord. So, Franco, thank you for that prayer and Janie powerful um, this morning as I was reading in Deuteronomy chapter 9 it's Moses giving the instructions to the Israelites before they cross the Jordan going to the promised land and he knows he isn't going to be with them anymore and um, he, he's trying to bolster their strength and their courage to continue with what the Lord has given them and as, just now as I was waiting out in the foyer it, it came to me you know what, what Moses is really saying to them is do not exchange relationship for a ritual. Do not do that. God had spent 40 years building a relationship with his people. They were about to enter a land full of pagans who worshiped idols, practiced child sacrifice, did every abominable thing that one could imagine anybody doing. And God is God. He knew they were going to stumble. <laughs> so he's trying to warn them, you know, as, as much as he can, and they still stumble anyway. But uh, we just need to get a hold of that. Never, never exchange our relationship for a ritual, ever. It, it's, a, it's important enough to God that he put a whole chapter in the Bible about it. So you should not forget that. On a housekeeping note this morning, I have one thing. If you're able-bodied at the end of service, we have wonderful cushioned chairs this morning, but they cannot go in that closet. So they have to go back to the music room, which is down this hall and on the right. Uh, so we certainly could use everybody's help to get them there because these are a little heavier than the metal ones. And just bear with us for that. It'd be much appreciated. But praise the Lord for his word. Amen. Well, I have a testimony. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, a little backstory. So I, we live in Cleveland Heights, me and my family, and there are a lot of trees. The houses are pretty close together. And we've had this tree behind our garage that used to, it hangs over the garage. And I don't know, maybe back in the fall or something, it sort of, not broke, but started leaning on the garage and another tree was kind of bracing it and um, we were just kind of needing to deal with it hadn't dealt with it I don't know if my dad knew how to or was able to um, and it's something I was aware of so I'd look at it and I'd be like oh my gosh like this is gonna fall it's gonna break our garage it's gonna ruin the cars where the cars are parked because it hung over 
And um, it might have been a week ago or something, I was with my brother Ben, and I don't know if we were in the kitchen or we were outside, we were talking about, I was talking about it like, oh my gosh, this tree, like... I, I don't see a way that it's not going to damage something. There's stuff to the left of it. There's stuff to the right of it. Our neighbor's yard is, and the fence is right behind it. Um, but God, like, you know, please just bring this tree down. We need it to come down. We don't have the tools to be able to deal with it. And uh, can it not destroy anything, you know? And it was just like a conversation prayer thing. It was kind of whatever. But we are like... He's done stuff like this before and forgot about it. And um, on Friday, I think it had been storming all night and then through the day and uh, nothing unusual. And I went into my room and just like plopped down on my bed for a second, which whatever. And I just look out my window and I'm like, oh my gosh. And all the branches, like half the tree from just what I could see, it's like someone had come and just sawed them all off and place them on top of the garage. And there are cars like parked up against the garage. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe this. Like that's, that's a miracle. Like, how did that even happen? It's not like the tree broke. It was like all the branches looked like they'd been sawed off. And later when I was going out, I just, I went outside and I was videoing it. Cause I was just like, this is amazing. And I walk around the side of the garage <laughs> to the back and I'm looking and where the tree had been attached and leaning on the garage, it was as if someone had picked up the tree, literally the whole thing ripped out of the trunk, picked it up and dragged it backwards about 15 or 20 feet and just laid it back down on the garage. Nothing was damaged. I mean, it couldn't have gone in any other direction. Like it made no sense. Um, and it was incredible. Like it was just, it was a miracle. So um, now we're able to cut up, you know, deal with the tree, but it was just the most wild thing and it was so unexpected and it I guess to what Ted was kind of sharing earlier um you know whatever you ask in my name I will do and it's not like we were it was it's kind of a nothing thing that I was asking I wasn't like pleading and praying and fasting about it but he did this thing and it was just so wild and I just had to share great <laughs> trees of the field will clap their hands and we will too. Well, speaking of trees, uh, yesterday I was getting ready to leave to uh, meet with the guys in Twinsburg at about seven in the morning and I got out to the end of the driveway and there was a tree completely going across the driveway. Uh, of course it had been windy so I kind of expected something would be happening. We have a lot of trees in the yard. So I, uh, I said, okay Lord, first of all I had to text the guy say I wouldn't be able to make it because I couldn't jump over the tree with the car. So I uh, back down my driveway if any of you know the driveway it's goes like this and it's um, long so it uh, took a long time for me to back down the driveway but praise the lord the chainsaw was working the chain was on where it should be uh, and though i had just about zero energy i um, went down and drove down and cut it in about 10 different places with the chainsaw. It stayed intact the whole time. That was the Lord, because it doesn't usually. Uh, then I uh, was able to get it in small enough pieces where I could drag it off into the ditch, which in the front of the house. And I, um, I came back into the house, and I was so totally exhausted. I slept almost the rest of the day. So the Lord gave me the strength to get done what needed to be done, and that was it. <laughs> I had nothing else for the day, but but uh, praise him that he, uh, he was there when I needed him. Amen.
me it was like there could be one more, but not. This week was an interesting week for me. Um, I've had a particular class that I'm teaching, and uh, I've had a lot of challenges with teaching this class. Um, I'll just put it this way: I, uh, I was a college student. Uh, for a very long time and I kind of know what a classroom kind of looks like at a college (laughs) I think I think (laughs) or at least I used to think (laughs) Um, but these students um, behave differently than I'm familiar with Um, and I have a very uh, large great diversity in the class um, as far as uh, and I'm just um, and it just uh, it kind of came to a head in an event on Thursday and I'm, I'm usually a pretty composed guy um, but I w- uh, I was losing my composure with the situation that I was dealing with in the classroom and I'm like I, and I'm, I'm just stunned because I'm like, I am having a bit difficult time understanding um, the behavior of some of my students. And I'm, I'm just trying to process it. And so I, I was, um, uh, so I'm, I'm still before the Lord trying to understand how to walk through this experience. And I, I don't know, I just thought about what we were praying about earlier, an unheralded event has happened among the nations, and how do you walk through that event? What does Israel do? We are in a season in our life where our our Christian principles have to stop being theoretical, <laughs> and they have to start being actual, and um, and so it's. Uh, that was striking me. I, I, I do want to share on, on a, a positive side that I had a, co- a colleague of mine was asking me about. Well, why is you know why is all this violence in the in the Middle East? What's all this tension about? And and then he's he was also out of the blue related to it. He asked about um, Melchizedek. <laughs> and uh, and so I had an opportunity, you know, to just have a conversation with him about it. And I didn't frame him, well, let me tell you what it is. I, I just kind of gave some, shared some thoughts that I felt that the Lord gave me to, to communicate with him. And, and I, then I, you know, I finished it with, well, these thoughts and, you know, 475 will get you a cup of coffee at, uh, um, but 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 I just put I was able to just put it out there before him, and so as we, as we're going forward um, in, in the Lord and dealing with um, unexpected circumstances and things that might take us aback, just this idea of the impression that I'm getting is just the idea of walking forward with open hands and just looking for the Lord to give us. It, Look, life is above our pay grade. <laughs> it, it, when you think you've got it under control, when you think you've got it figured out, then you'll be reawakened to the fact that you don't. And, and so um, it's, um, I'm just processing this, and I, I was so glad for the songs that we sang this morning about thinking just about a sense of awe of the Lord and just kind of letting that freshly permeate our lives and what that might look like, so... Amen. Well, just before I begin, uh, lest I forget, I want to say that uh, 
we, Sylvia and I had mentioned that we were given a gift back at Christmas time from Harvest Net Ministries to be able to go to Paris for a week. And so we are leaving this Thursday. We'll be back the following Friday, so we'll just miss one Sunday. And uh, Laura Bear is coming in, and most of you know her, and just great voice, and the rest of the team will be with her, but you'll have a great time with her, and Derek will be sharing. So um, just wanted you to know that, and we've been looking forward to that and turning our attention to that in some ways, watching YouTube videos about what to do and what not to do in Paris. It's all been good. So the anticipation is building. So friends, we are now, as we go through this series of messages on the Upper Room Discourse taken from John's Gospel, chapters 13 through 17, we're now up already at part 15. This is going to be the last part of chapter 16. This is the last teaching portion that Jesus does. And then most of you know, as we go into chapter 17, this will be Jesus' prayer for his disciples. And so my thought is, when I get back, I can conclude with this. But this morning, we're going to be looking at a message which we're titling, Sorrow Turned Into Joy. Ted Muir has already read the passage for us, so I'm not going to be reading it before I go into the teaching. But let's just pause and pray as we're looking at God's holy word. Lord, as we approach your word, we are asking once again that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Grant us understanding. And we pray you would open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law, out of your word. And Lord, we do need that help of the Holy Spirit. And you promised that help, and so we receive it now. And we lean into that that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, we are in John 16, and we'll roll right into this. Jesus goes on and continues to say, a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. Well, I'm glad they said that. <laughs> There's actually lots of things that Jesus says that I'm still trying to unpack, and theologians are still trying to unpack, and they were a little bit puzzled by this. A few things to say about this. Uh, one commentator, Tasker, points out there's a different word used here in Greek for saying. I have it underlined at the bottom there, verse 18, from that used in the first part of the verse. Hence, we do not know what he means. And I think that's pretty clear from the context. We don't know what he's saying. What he, I mean, obviously they can hear vibrations going into their ears, but as far as what does this mean? And then also the use of the imperfect tense, they said, they, they said or they kept on asking, shows that they must have held consultation amongst themselves about it and that the discourse did not proceed as an uninterrupted lecture. So again, this is John is inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us the gospel as we have it. But as I pointed out previously, Jesus was saying a lot more things and they were responding and doing things a lot more than just what we have recorded here. And that's why this, this gospel is so dense. I'm looking at one of the commentators, actually it's sermon series that the guys did. He would just do one line and you've got a whole half hour sermon. I mean, it's just, it's so dense what could be said at every point. But I'd like to just say one other thing here. And this kind of came to me very early in the morning, earlier this week. I woke up and I was just like, hmm, yeah, I'm going to be working on the message. Lord, what's that stuff about a little while? And just one thought came to me. None of the commentators picked this up, and so I don't know how valid this is, but I just submit it to you. There, well, Jesus is a little while, and then a little while. I'm going to the Father, and later you're going to see, oh, okay, you're talking about you're going to go die, and there'll be resurrection, and 
But why didn't Jesus say, now look guys, I've said previously when the Son of Man goes up to Jerusalem, he's going to be betrayed by the elders, chief priests, the Romans are going to do to him, and he's going to be killed, crucified, and the third day he'll rise again. He said that previously when, when Peter made his confession, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He could have done that right here. He doesn't do that. Well, Jesus, why don't you just say that? And the thought came to me, Jesus is telling them, I'm, undergo, I'm going to undergo probably one of the worst deaths anyone can undergo, but this is the way I want you to think about death. I'm going to the Father. A little while you won't see me, a little while you're going to see me. I'm going to... and, and so it is for us. The Bible says this momentary light affliction not to be compared with the eternal weight of glory that is to be revealed in a momentary life. But man, when you're going through, it doesn't seem momentary. But on the scope of God's program, if you talk about eternity, whatever we're going through is momentary, yet a little while. And so he wants us to think about this as death for the Christian is ultimately going to the Father. So he is actually instructing them. And it is enigmatic, it is kind of figurative, it is that, but at some other very profound way, he's communicating the way we ought to think about death going to the Father. Now, you would think, and this is, I've read John so many times, but as I'm teaching on this, it just struck me how much time is spent on this, because, okay, we've got this little wild thing going on. we got more of it here. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. I mean, just, I mean God doesn't waste his breath. And you can't carry around, you know, a multi-volume, you know, New York phone book. Of the, but God decided to repeat this. I mean, it's just, and at that point, I, I don't even know what to say to you. But it's just interesting that Jesus spells this all out again. I like what McLaren said here. Note how they pass by the greater truths in order to fasten upon a smaller outstanding difficulty. They have no questions to ask about the gifts of the Spirit, nor about the unity of Christ and his disciples as represented in the vine and the branches, nor about what he tells them of the love that lays down his life for his friends. But when he comes into the region of chronology, they are all agog to know when about which he is so enigmatically speaking. So I just find that hilarious. I mean, we tend to do that. Uh, second coming of Christ, when's the rapture? When? And look, those are good questions, important questions. But, dear friends, there's heavier duty stuff than that. But we do kind of tend to get agog and distracted by certain things. So just need to be careful of that. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now, again, he hasn't just spelled out, now look, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. When I rise again, you're going to be joy. He's kind of laying some things out here some things that they could wrap their heart around. But there's also a reason why he's using this image of the woman uh, in labor. Now, first of all, I want to pull from uh, David Guzik. I like what he says here. God's, uh, several of the commentators said this. God's work was not to replace their sorrow with joy, but to turn sorrow into joy, as he often does in our lives. The sorrow would be directly connected to their coming joy, even as the sorrow of a woman in childbirth is directly connected to her joy that a child has been born into the world. It's a subtle distinction, but it's not just, oh, it's and then you take that away and then you have joy, but it's actually in the very thing that's causing the suffering, it morphs. And this is why, this is why, and I cited it previously, that passage, Paul, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this momentary light affliction, that very thing you're going through, is working in you, what? An eternal weight of glory. So that thing that is causing sorrow will absolutely produce joy. It's that very thing that's causing the sorrow. Now, we don't invite sorrows, and we don't 
take upon ourselves things that we shouldn't take, and there's a place for, you know, resisting the enemy and all those kind of things moving in faith. But at some other levels, as Jesus promises, in the world you will have tribulation. It just says shortly, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But also I just want to mention this, uh, the birth pains of Messiah, Shevle Mashiach, this is uh, the sages, the rabbis, had this idea several times in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. It, it refers to uh, God's deliverance coming like birth pangs, and the people are in travail, but then, uh, it, like Isaiah 66, as soon as she tra travailed, Zion brought forth. So there's this place of uh, giving birth, and it's found in Micah, and I didn't want to bog us down too much with a lot of different Bible references. But the idea here, friends, is the Jewish people perceived this age, present age, and then the age to come, the age of Messiah. And just before the age of Messiah, there will be a lot of tumult in the nations giving birth to that new age, okay? Well, here, because Jesus is the Messiah, he's undergoing death, burial, and resurrection, there's some birth pang things going on right now. Now, what's interesting is, and I didn't bring the verse up here, but uh, Matthew 24 and some of the other passages in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus says, when you hear of wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, these are the beginning of, King James says, sorrows, good translation, birth pangs, but the end is not yet. In that context, clearly it's something happening later. So, so what's the deal? The Jewish people saw we're in this age, and when Messiah comes, there'll be birth pangs, and then the new age. What do we understand from the coming of Jesus? The Messiah comes in two stages. He comes a first time, and he comes a second time. And in that coming the first time, there are birth pangs, as he is birthing, really, the kingdom, something that we can enter. And all of us who have been born from above have been birthed through these birth pangs of the cross and the resurrection. So, again, this is an entire message, right? Right? But I just want to tell you, as we're reading, the layers that are involved here. This is also this idea of the already of the kingdom, but the not yet of the kingdom. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. He says, I will see you. Now remember, we just read... 16, again, a little while, you will see me. Okay, but it's just, I, and I never saw that until I really got into this. The disciples will see him again after he rises. So a little while they won't see him as he undergoes death, burial. But then when he rises, they will see him again. But also he says, I will see you. And there's just something about that. Again, you can do a whole riff on God seeing us. El Roi, the God who sees me. And so there's something about the Lord seeing us, knowing us. All things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Much more can be said here, but I'm going to move on. And your joy, no one will take from you. Even though he has told them, warned them. When it actually happens, you know that they all fled. They're all devastated. But then when he appears, they're just overcome with joy, and it's so real, that joy, that reality, that he has conquered death, and we're going to follow him. All of that, that joy could not be taken away, no matter what was thrown at them. And we know that from church history, all of those original apostles died a martyr's death except for John. But they died in joy. And in that day, you will ask me nothing, this future time 
after Jesus has undergone death or resurrection, gone back to the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Now, this is interesting. Up until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to go back here. I thought I had something. So I want to say a couple of things here. Earlier, he says, uh, whatever you ask, I will give you. Here he says, the Father will give you. But in another place in the Gospel of John, he says, whatsoever the Son sees the Father doing, that he does also. There is this way in which Father, Son, Holy Spirit, even when we talk about the resurrection, who resurrected Jesus? It says the Father. It says the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness. Rises. But Jesus says, no one takes my life. I lay it down and I take it up again. You can't dice out God. And so it's, it's this tricky thing about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But here he's wanting us to know that we can ask of the Father and receive that our joy may be full. And notice, in that day, you will ask me nothing. Uh, surely, whatever you ask the Father in my name. See, it's got to be Jesus has to undergo death, burial, resurrection, be exalted to the right hand, all that he's accomplished. Then that enables us to pray in his name. Let's go on. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. And here, here I have it. Uh, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But here, the Father is going to do it because he loves us. And again, I like what several of the commentators pointed out. This is not a matter of God is constantly angry and Jesus is there. Well, Father, because I died for them, uh, please tolerate them. No, 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 no. That's a wrong way of thinking. I mean, the, God, God the Father, so loved the world. We talked about this earlier. He gave his son. The Father loves. The Son loves. The Father loves us. But Jesus came to reveal the Father and so now he's been with his disciples, but he's now saying, in what I'm going to undergo, it's going to bring you into a new dimension in a way that you can connect with the Father that you never did before. Now, the Jewish people then and up to this very day refer to God as their Father. And I've heard some preachers, I've read some things say, the Jewish people don't refer to God as Father. Well, you make yourself look pretty ignorant that way. They have a, a prayer that's referred to, my Father, my King. but they do not address God as Abba, which is Aramaic for father. The Jewish people of this day, kids refer to their dad as Abba. We've heard it when we've been in Israel. And we're told in two different places in the Bible, Romans, Galatians, that we who have received the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This is what gets opened up to us. So it's not as though the Israelite people didn't have some concept of God as Father, not merely as Creator, but no, He's the Father. He, he's the progenitor. He brought forth Israel through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But this is a level of intimacy just simply not available until Jesus comes because at at the end of the day, or let me just say, at the heart of reality, there is God in whom there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Son is even referred to as being in the bosom of the Father. And this language of, as God is trying to communicate, God's pretty smart, by the way, and people have used the illustration of, imagine you're a human and you're trying to communicate to an ant. And that's not really fair because we're made in his image. He's given us the ability to comprehend. But still, God is so great. It's, he's trying to communicate calculus to us who barely understand 2 plus 2 is 4. 
but he's pretty smart. And so the way he wants to communicate, look, just so you can understand, it's I'm father and I have a son. That there's a unique relationship there. And I'm going to work things in such a way and work it into you by my spirit that you will have a spirit of adoption in which you can cry, Abba, Father. I'm, that's the best I can do with it. It's, it's wild and deep and wonderful. In that day, you will ask in my name. I like what McLaren says, a couple things here. What is the name of Christ? His whole revealed character. So these disciples could not pray his name hitherto because his character was not all revealed. Therefore, to pray in his name is to pray, recognizing what he is as revealed in his life and death and resurrection and ascension, and to base all our dependence of acceptance of our prayers upon that revealed character. That's a nice piece, isn't it? So why weren't they praying in Christ's name prior? This whole package has to come forth before you can really pray in Jesus' name. But further, if I say that I am doing something in your name, that means on your behalf, as your representative, as your organ, and to express your mind and will. And if we pray in Christ's name, that implies not only our dependence upon his merit and work, but also the harmony of our wills with his will, and that our requests are not merely the hot products of our own selfishness, but are the calm issues of communion with him. Thus to pray requires the suppression of self. Paul says, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives. All of that. And so, dear friends, there are these exceeding great and precious promises for prayer, which we've only begun to scratch the surface of. No, nope, I'll get buried if I go down that. There's so much that can be said here, you know that. But we're going to go on. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Now, this is really good. I've got this color-coded for you. I like what David Guzik says. This is a remarkable summary of the work of Jesus. I came forth from the Father. Jesus is God, having existed in heaven's glory and goodness before he ever came to earth. And have come into the world. Jesus was born as a man, having added humanity to deity. And others have pointed out, well, hey, we were all born. Jesus wasn't just born like a, okay, great. So, so Ted was born, that's nice, I was too. No, he chooses to come into the world. Again, I leave the world. So we have a coming in and a going out. Jesus would die and then and go to the Father. Jesus would rise from the dead and ascend to the Father. I mean, this is Apostles' Creed stuff. I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord, and crucified, uh, buried, risen again, ascended. I mean, that's why we have this in the creed. It's this stuff right here. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Now when I was reading this again, I'm going, I'm not quite sure why all of a sudden the light bulb went on. And as all the commentators are agree, it's good that they got this. And some of the things he said that he said before, but now it's kind of dawning. And yet this confession of faith, Jesus is going to say it's a little bit wobbly. But they're having this flash moment. And by the way, now you're speaking plainly, but the reality is they won't fully get the plain idea until he undergoes death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and then they, they will be writing further about what all this means and the implications. But somehow, they sense that they're kind of getting this. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Remember, 
Clear back in John 13, he said, all of you will leave me this night. Smite the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. Peter, not so, Lord. Remember that? We talked about that. He said that clear back at the beginning, and he's saying it now. So this is just, the Lord knows our number, and he, he loves them, he loves them. John 13, he loved them to the end, to the telos, to the fullest extent. He's, he's kind of glad to see the exuberance, but it doesn't change the fact that they're going to leave. But he's, he has patiently laid all these things out so that when it comes to pass, they'll, they'll get it. And he says, you're all going to leave me alone, but I'm not alone. And this is a little lesson for all of us. I, I just think it's part of the curriculum of life, and this isn't me, I'm using that kind of generically. Life is such that at the end of the day, we stand before God alone. Even if you're married, you got kids, because they are a human being in their own right. A, B, because of fallenness. No one is quite the bosom buddy that we imagine. And there will come that time when you feel very much alone. And this is when it's good to know, if you are really born again, if you really have your father as a father God, then you're not alone. You're not alone. The father is with me. I like what F.F. Bruce said. Jesus read their hearts better than they knew. Not only could he answer their unspoken questions, he could assess the strength of their belief in him. It was sincere and genuine, bound up with their love for him, but it was about to be exposed to a test such as they had not imagined. I mean, this is the thing. It's, it's genuine. They love him, and we love him. And yet the Lord at times puts us to the test. I have failed tests. And yet, by the grace of God, I'm still here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. May I invite the worship team to come. These things I've spoken to you, really the whole discourse. So that, because remember, he begins, you believe in God. Let not your heart be troubled. Let, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. He knows. I mean, how do. We mentioned a history-making event today that's dust on the scale of God's scales compared to this. This is the fulcrum of all of history. Prophecy being fulfilled, the plan of God coming to a fulcrum fruition. And he prophesied of images of a Messiah coming lowly to you, riding on a colt, even... Uh, suffering, Isaiah 53, and yet there's this son of man, kind of a glorified figure in Daniel chapter 7, and which is it? The rabbis later even kind of surmise maybe there's going to be two messiahs, Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David, a son of David, son of Joseph. They're trying to put this together. Here's these, just these fishermen. I'm just trying to be a good Jewish guy, and, here I, and then here's Jesus, a little while, a little while. What's this saying? I, but they love Jesus. You love Jesus, and yet Jesus is going to do something that's going to really jar them. And he, he wants them to have peace. And initially, when the garden comes and they all flee, they're not going to have peace. But when he rises, remember, he appears in the upper room. What's the first thing he says? Peace be unto you. Receive you the Holy Spirit. Friends, there is a promise that in me you will have peace. I like this. Notice, in me you may have peace. In the world, notice, in me, in the world. You will have peace, you will have tribulation. And notice, in me you may have peace. In the world you will. The world, <laughs> in the world you will, that's a promise. Promise from Jesus. You will have tribulation. And look, human beings undergo all sorts of stuff, but this is more specifically, if you're all who all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer 
persecution. That's from my promise basket. I just encourage myself with that every single day. You shall suffer. The world doesn't get it. And if you're really walking with the Lord, you're going to get reactions. Derek was getting reactions in his classroom. Richard gets reactions on, in the workplace. See Tammy nodding her head. It just, it's the way it is. Now, in me, you may. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. But there's ways in which we need to lean into that. We need to look to Him, or we can be overwhelmed with many things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests be known unto God. And the, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Sorrow turned into joy. Friends, let's stand. Thought it would be good that we would end on a song of joy. And just as there was that tribulation, birth pangs bringing forth the beginning of the kingdom, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, so it is at the end of the age. There are birth pangs. There are increased tribulations. But we are lifting up our heads for our redemption draws near and our focus is on his great salvation. And that's what this song is all about. Let's sing together. And this is in a 3-4 time, or a 6-8 time, I should say, kind of like a waltz. So either you can sway back and forth or kind of clap your hands like this, or imagine you've got your drink in your hand. You're kind of swinging it like at a, a Munich beer mall. We're celebrating.
in the song of the Lamb. We will dance. Oh, we will dance on the streets that are golden. Glorious bride in the great Son of Man. From every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the Lamb. We'll join in the song In the song of the Lamb. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, of your promise of turning sorrow into joy. We receive it, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. And now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to that power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church through Jesus Christ, both now and and evermore, world without end. Amen and amen. And now, as Mark reminded us, for those who are able-bodied, you can just follow him over and uh, take some chairs. That'd be great.